Okay, so hello everybody and uh, welcome to the uh, ESDR uh, kitchen. My name is Eli Sprecher. I'm from the Department of Dermatology at the Tel Aviv Medical Center in Israel. And on behalf of the board and my co-chair, uh, Professor Bernard Homi, I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, new molecular cuisine episode of the ESDR kitchen. I'd like to remind you that uh, the, uh, all the ESDR program and the previous episodes are available on the on our website. Um, and as you must know by now, the, the molecular cuisine uh, is usually delivered by uh, leaders in their field who share their personal journey to scientific uh, discovery. And today we are particularly pleased to welcome an internationally recognized and outstanding scientist and a dear friend, uh, Professor Edel Otum. So a brief uh, introduction. Uh, Edel, he's professor of molecular dermatology and central lead of the Center for Cell Biology and Titanium Research at the Blizzard Institute in Queen Mary University of London. She's also consultant dermatologist at the Royal London Hospital, and she has a special interest for pediatric dermatology and rare skin disorders. She has received a medical degree <clears throat> and PhD from the University College of Galway in Ireland, and she trained in medicine and dermatology in Ireland as well, followed by four years at Northwestern in Chicago, where she worked on keratinocyte biology, and she completed a dermatology training in London. The research interests uh, include the uh, biology of the basement membrane, the skin barrier, rare disease biology, and genetics. She has received uh, numerous awards and recognition for her work, including uh, the Everett C. Fox Award from the American Academy of Dermatology, the Jacob Medal uh, Section of Dermatology, Royal Academy of Medicine uh, in Ireland, the Fox Weber Lecture and Medal from the Royal College of Physicians in London, Stuart Maddox Lecture. So, uh, just before moving on, I'd like to uh, remind you that uh, we will have at the end of the session a short Q&A session. So please forward all your queries to the chat or the, or the Q&A function. And then on behalf of all, of all of us, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for the opportunity to hear about your fascinating journey to the genetics of skin diseases and uh, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thanks, Sally. Um, I'm delighted to uh, talk to you all about um, my work and thanks so much for the invitation. So I have the following industry uh, declarations. Um, I don't get any money myself. Uh, so I'm Irish. I was I was brought up in Ireland uh, in a small place uh, in the west of Ireland called uh, Leedan. Um, it's a very beautiful place at the end of uh, Kildare Harbour. And um, I went to this school here, primary school, which had uh, two teachers. So there was four classes in each room. Um, my interest in science, I think, came from my, my dad, who was an agricultural scientist and a farmer in his spare time. And when I was about eight or nine, I was very interested in uh, wildflowers and how you could classify them. And uh, I have this book at home, which is still at home, uh, about uh, wildflowers. And actually, classifying wildflowers is very similar to dermatology. You know, you, you uh, look and you try and decide uh, what's the, the, the right uh, disorder. I studied medicine in Galway. Um, it's a long story, so I'm not going to tell it here how I got into dermatology, but it was totally by accident. Um, and in 1994, I uh, moved to Chicago to do research after training in internal medicine and dermatology uh, in Ireland. Uh, I was at Northwestern uh, with David Woodley. Uh, May Chen was there at the time as well, and I think had a major influence on my career. Uh, she, she was working on type 7 collagen. David was interested in the basic membrane, but he was also interested in keratinocyte migration. Uh, my first year in the lab was not a great success. I, I fell in the dark room at eight o'clock in the morning and uh, broke my ankle in, I think, eight places. Um, so it was sort of one, the downside of the academic roller coaster. Uh, however, five months later, 
went out for lunch at a Chinese uh, restaurant and I got one of these fortune cookies, which said, you will feel you are the luckiest person in the world. And I came back to the lab and there was a FedEx envelope from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So I had got this uh, fellowship for the following three years. So I went from a period of feeling very down to a feeling of being, you know, very excited uh, for the following three years. Um, so keratinocyte migration is an important part of uh, wound healing. Um, we used various migration assays in the lab. Uh, we used uh, a colloidal gold assay, which you can see here on the left, or a scratch assay, which you can see on the right. We also used various uh, explant assays, which you can see here. So keratinocytes going outwards or pieces of skin going outwards. Um, we were interested particularly in hypoxia, the idea being that under a, an occlusive dressing where the oxygen is very low, uh, you get increased reepithelialization. And we showed that hypoxia increases keratinocyte migration on type 1 collagen. So the left is normoxia and the right is hypoxia. Um, and you can see that there's an increase in migration under hypoxic conditions. We showed that this is uh, related to increased expression of Ezrin, a protein in lamellopodia, and also due to increased activity of metalloproteinase uh, 9. I also did some work there on the basement membrane on both laminin 332 uh, and type 7 collagen. Um, but I guess I'm, the main thing I gained from my period at Northwestern was uh, basic lab expertise, knowledge about extracellular matrix and keratinocyte biology. And something I learned very much from David was David always got very excited about any new, new finding, no matter how minute it was. So, you know, even if you got an antibody to work that you've been trying for a bit, you know, he, he was just... He was just um, very enthusiastic about research. And that's so important, I think, maintaining morale and just, you know, keeping at it, especially when things aren't going well. So in 1998, at the end of 1998, I decided to move to Europe. So I moved to London to complete my training, training in dermatology. And at the, the very last year, so in the early 2000, I moved to Whitechapel to the London Hospital. Um, and this is where I have been ever since. And I was influenced here by two people. One was David Page, who was a pediatric dermatologist who's now retired, who was uh, interested in ichthyosis. So he taught me about ichthyosis. And the second was Professor Irene Lee, who was head of the academic department uh, and is an expert or was an expert on palmoplantar keratoderma. So she taught me uh, sort of the basics, the ABC of palmoplantar keratoderma, which is quite a niche area. Um, so I've stayed here ever since. We've got a new hospital and I work in the Blizzard Institute, uh, which is here. So I'm going to talk about three things after that bit of background. I'm going to talk about some work on dystrophic epidermolysis pilosa. I'm going to talk a little bit about some uh, very recent work on harlequin ichthyosis. I'm also going to mention patient and public engagement. So type 7 collagen uh, mutations cause severe generalized recessive dystrophic EB. And with these loss of function mutations, uh, as you see in the lower panel, you get very minimal or no expression of type 7 collagen. And these patients develop very aggressive SCCs. Um, and I've sort of postulated that this is because of loss of collagen 7 rather than, you know, increased inflammation or scarring. And we showed in this paper some time ago in the Journal of Cell Science that when you knock down collagen 7 in an SDC7, you get increased invasion uh, into collagen gels. Um, and we use this 3D model where you have a collagen matrigel gel with fibroblasts incorporated. You put SEC keratinocytes on the top, and you allow the model to grow uh, at a near fluid interface. And here you can see uh, in the right panel, um, SI-COL7 
the SEC cells are migrating a lot more into the collagen gel than in the control. We then went on to develop stable knockdown of collagen 7 and collagen 4 in cutaneous SCC using shRNA lentiviral particles, including a turbo GFP reporter gene. And here you can see we got good knockdown, you can see in the third lane of each gel. Um, we grew the gels in the organotypic model for um, a week and then transferred them onto immunodeficient mice and incubated for six weeks. When we harvested the tumours, we no noticed that in the SHCOL7 tumours in the middle, there was increased vascularization. We confirmed this by MECA32 staining, um, which is an antibody specific for mouse blood vessels. And we also confirmed an increase in the vessel number and an increase in the vessel diameter in SHCOL7. We then went on and looked at, looked at uh, RDB SCCs, and we showed that there were increased uh, numbers of vessels of increased diameter in RDB SCC in the upper panel compared to non-EB SCC in the lower panel. We then thought maybe it'll be increased in, in RDB skin as well, you know, so skin without SCCs. So in RDB skin, Again, we saw increased numbers of vessels of increased diameter compared with non-EB skin. So we next asked the question, is loss of collagen 7 leading to increased secretion of proangiogenic factors? And we used uh, two assays to examine this. Uh, we first of all looked at HUVEX cells forming tubes in the presence of media with and without collagen 7 in the lower two panels. And you can see that uh, when we quantified this, in the presence of SHCOL7 media, there was uh, increased tube uh, formation. And um, we also looked at the proangiogenic factors in the media using a protein array. And we found that there were many angiogenic factors increased, including uh, VEGF thrombospondin 1, which had previously been shown by Andy South to be up in EB, active in A, and amphiregulin. Uh, and here you can see we confirmed that VEGF is very much upregulated in uh, RDB SCC samples compared with the controls. Um, as TGF beta has been shown to mediate VEGF um, expression, we then looked at components of the TGF beta pathway, and we found that TGF beta receptor 1, twist, fibronectin, and alpha phi beta 6 were all upregulated in the SHCOL7 uh, xenografts. Again, we found the same thing in tumors from patients, so RDB patients, uh, there was a markedly increased expression of all these. Uh, proteins which are downstream of TGF beta. We used a SMAD binding element luciferase reporter, which we transfected into EB patient uh, derived SCC cell line without collagen 7. And um, we plated the, these cells on BSA or human recombinant collagen 7 with either uh, an IgG control or an antibody to the alpha 2 uh, integrin. And basically, we were able to show that in the presence of human recombinant collagen 7, uh, the luciferase uh, signal went down. And when the antibody was used to break the interaction between collagen 7 and alpha 2, uh, the uh, signal went up again. And we showed the same by Western blotting. We then went on to look at an in vivo model. So we used the zebrafish embryo. Uh, we injected uh, dye label, red dye labeled cells into the embryo. So we used again an RDB SCC cell line with collagen 7. And here you can see on this video, on the left, you've got the tumor in an orangey red color. The blood vessels are in green. And you can see with PBS, the blood vessel seems to be going towards and into the tumor. Uh, when we added human recombinant collagen 7, we found that the uh, vessel uh, stayed away from the tumor. 
And finally, we looked back again at our uh, mouse um, senior graphs. We repeated the experiment, but added in human recombinant collagen 7. And we showed that by adding human recombinant collagen 7, we could decrease blood vessel formation uh, and also decrease vascular endothelial growth factor. So we published this in the JNCI, if you want to read uh, further about it. I think there's much more work to be done in this area, including the effect of um, hypoxia. Um, and we have done some, some more work on, on this. Um, second thing I'm going to talk about is harlequin ichthyosis. So harlequin ichthyosis is the most severe type of ichthyosis. Um, the baby has a shocking appearance at birth, uh, but after that hard skin comes off, it's a red scaly baby. So like any, anybody with severe ichthyosis. Um, harlequin ichthyosis is an epidermal barrier defect with massive hyperkeratosis of the stratum corneum, seen here in this photomicrograph on the right. And the fetal skin biopsy is up to 10 times normalness. And it's known that on electron microscopy, the lamellar granules or lamellar bodies are very abnormal. So they're small, poorly formed in harlequin ichthyosis. Um, and with David Kelsel, we found the mutation that causes harlequin ichthyosis in ABCA12 in 2005. So ABCA12 is an ABC transport uh, that's important in transporting glucosal ceramides um, fr from the stratum granulosum into the stratum corneum. And at the same time, Hiroshi Shimizu also found uh, that ABCA12 uh, call, uh, mutations cause harlequin ichthyosis. More recently, we've gone on to do bulk RNA sequencing in harlequin ichthyosis skin. Um, when we looked by functional annotation clustering, we found that changes in genes involved in epidermal differentiation, uh, epidermal um, flat fat uh, regulation, desquamation, and inflammation. So I'm going to concentrate on the inflammation. So we found changes in IL-1 like cytokines, including IL-36, and changes in the interferon mediated response, uh, such as STAT1. And here you can see we've confirmed that phosphostat is upregulated in harlequin ichthyosis skin. Um, we then went on and looked at INOS, uh, which is an important uh, mediator downstream of uh, JAK uh, STAT1 pathway. Again, we showed that INOS was markedly upregulated in harlequin ichthyosis skin, quantified up here on the right. Um, and that we also were able to confirm that IL-36 alpha and IL-36 gamma were markedly upregulated, whereas IL-37, the inhibitor of that pathway, was down in harlequin ichthyosis skin. We went on and developed an ABCA12 knockout model using CRISPR cas 9 So we deleted exon uh, 27. Uh, here you can see that it worked. We've got a, a knockout cell-cell line uh, with very marked uh, decreased expression of ABCA12 on PCR and no detectable ABCA12 on Western blotting. We put this into our organotypic uh, model. And here you can see that the ABCA12 knockout model uh, shows epidermal thickening. Um, and for comparison on the left is adult patient skin. Um, we could see early expression of involucrin, uh, like you see in harlequin ichthyosis in the model. But the most impressive thing was the change in Nile red staining. So uh, you can see in harlequin ichthyosis, uh, polar is pretty absent, and we see the same thing in the model. We went on and looked at uh, dye permeability, so permeability through the organotypic using uh, a lucifer yellow dye. And here you can see that the ABCA12 wild type model retained the dye above the epidermis, whereas the knockout model, uh, the dye just went through. And we looked at uh, INOS in the model, and it was increased. And also looked at the inno intracellular concentration, and that was also increased. Uh, we then use this selective inhibitor uh, of uh, INOS um, 
and showed that it could reduce the you know, intracellular concentration in the model. And um, we then moved on and used it in the model in 3D. And here you can see that uh, there is some improvement in the model here. You get some cornification uh, compared uh, with the uh, control knockout cells. So you can see that diagonally the ABCA12 wild type control and the ABCA12 knockout treated with INOS uh, are pretty similar. Uh, and also we showed that uh, the skin uh, permeability was reduced. So the uh, barrier had uh, come back, uh, again confirmed by Nile red uh, staining. We were also interested in the use of JAK inhibitors in this model. And we showed the same thing here with JAK inhibitors. So we used tofacitinib. Uh, so here you can see that the knockout model on the right hand side, you get some cornification and you get return of the Nile red staining. So this was actually a surprise to us because when we looked for expression of JAKs uh, in the model, we were unable to detect expression of PhosphoJAK1, PhosphoJAK2, or PhosphoJAK3, suggesting that it's an off-target effect. If you want to read more about this, you can read about it in our JCI paper, which was published in 2020. And um, so following on in this work, we've got funding from LifeArc to look at five uh, JAK inhibitors. Uh, in the harlequinicosis model. And we're also collaborating with Ian Smythe, um, and we're going to pick the two best inhibitors to use in his mouse model, which was reported in Cell Reports Medicine in 2020. So I just want to talk a little bit about how my interaction with patients has enriched my research. So I've been very involved with ichthyosis support group in the UK for the last 17 years. Um, webinars, more recently, uh, support days for families and conferences. I'm now chair of the Medical Advisory Board. We answer questions from families and members. And I can also encourage patients to participate in research. I've also been very involved with PC Project. Uh, so uh, PC Project is a support group for Pachynechia congenita. Uh, and I will call them the three uh, musketeers here. I've learned, learned a lot from them over the last uh, 10 years or maybe even more uh, as part of the genet genetics group. We meet monthly to discuss uh, cases. Um, as a result of this, I've seen that steatocystoma multiplex is very much an unmet need and have obtained funding uh, from the Leo Foundation to study this disease and its pathogenesis in more detail. Steatocystomas most commonly occur in, in, in the presence of Keratin 17 mutations, but also call, occur in other types of PC. I've also become involved in some, some trials in PC and other PPK, so topical serolimus for PC, and there may be trials in the future for topical erlotinib, which is an EGF receptor, and topical trip B3 antagonists. Finally, I've become involved in the uh, Human Cell Atlas project in this project, which is to look at pediatric skin of diverse ancestry, uh, diverse location, and diverse ages. Um, and as part of this, we're going to have a game for the center of the cell, which is a um, part of our institute. It's a, a, a science learning center in a research lab. The idea is to inspire uh, children to be interested in science and medicine. Um, there's a pod inside, so we've got funding for a game for the pod on skin, which is going to be exciting and will be an opportunity to talk about normal skin, but also to talk about my favourite diseases. Um, so I would like to acknowledge everybody who has helped with this work, um, particularly for the scientific work shown, uh, Florence, uh, who's here, who worked on harlequin ichthyosis and Matt and Vera who helped with the EB project and all my other collaborators and the patients um, and all the diverse uh, funders that have funded me over the years. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, 
Thank you very much, Adele, for this um, very interesting journey of yours and the excellent talk, excellent science. I want to encourage everybody to give us uh, questions via the chat. And I would like to start with uh, one question uh, regarding your Collagen 7 um, part of the journey. So since migration, invasion, and also angiogenesis are also controlled by chemokine receptors, I was wondering whether your data also suggested that chemokine receptors on keratinocytes are dysregulated and whether there is also an autocrine loop via which um, keratinocyte migration could be enhanced by the loss of collagen 7. And there is a communication between keratinocytes and vessels via this route. Okay, so in that Journal of Cell Science paper, we actually looked at CXCR3 and we were able to show the reason we looked at CXCR3 was, we, was because we found on back then it was uh, AFMetrix gene expression arrays that PLC beta 4 was up and um, CXCR3 and phospholipase C beta 4 interlinked. Um, we haven't explored that further from the point of view of CXCR3, but we have from the perspective of PLC beta 4. And PLC beta 4 seems to be uh, an important um, regulator of, of invasion. Hmm. Yeah. So no questions on the chat uh, other than the one I asked uh, with regard to commercially. Oh, once. And then Ellie, you go first, you go first. Yeah, I, I mean, I was just asking myself because very often we see those inflammatory responses in different genodermatoses can be um, uh, codification disorders, EB, and many others. And the question I always ask myself, and there have been some papers, but it, nothing really too convincing, is what is the, uh, the exact interaction between the basic genetic defect and uh, some kind of pre-existing uh, pro-inflammatory or just contrary anti-inflammatory response characterizing a specific individual because we are dealing here with very uh, rare diseases so it's always small numbers and the question if we have enough data to suggest that what we are looking at is really um, something which can be directly connected to the underlying defect given the variability in this inflammatory response in and the fact that we can see it in many different diseases which are not necessarily connected. Mm. I mean, that's a good question. I, I mean, I have sort of tried to focus on specific genes and specific gene knockout and try and control for everything so that your inflammatory response, if you see it, is specific to that gene. Um, However, I agree, obviously, every person is different. We, we know now from COVID, for example, there was a paper in Nature last week or the week, week before showing that there are, I don't know, 10 groups of responders to COVID based on their genetic findings. So I agree it's a, a difficult area to untangle. But I think that understanding more about um, rare diseases does give us a lot of insights into common diseases. So for example, understanding more about rare barrier defects gives us insight into eczema. Understanding more about the basement membrane gives us insights into aging, etc. Thank you. I think there are some questions in the Q&A. Let me see. So do you find it harder or easier to find funding for rare diseases versus common diseases? Um, I think it depends on how you pitch it. So for example, uh, the funding I got recently from the uh, Leo Foundation was for steatosystoma multiplex, and they don't generally fund um, research on rare disease. Um, but I guess I pitched it that I was, you know, modeling the sebaceous gland in vitro 
and also that insights into the sebaceous gland with keratin 17 mutations would give insights into other disorders which are a bit more common like hydradenitis superativa for example uh, or you know even acne or just dry skin and the role of the sebaceous gland. Um, there are charities obviously that, that, that fund rare disease certainly in the UK and worldwide so for example Deborah for EB. Um, the other thing I find is that you know regardless of it's if, if, it's, if you're asking for 10k versus you're asking for 800,000k the amount of work involved is almost the same <laughs> uh, so you still have to write like 42 pages or whatever. Um, I mean, I have, I have in the past and in the present, I'm also working on atopic eczema in the Bangladeshi population. Um, and I would say it's the same, you know, getting funding for rare disease versus common disease. It's the same, similar. So the second question comes uh, from Alain Huvani. Uh, the one, he can congratulates you and um, any clinical translation related to INOS inhibition for Harlequin's is ichthyosis? Um, no, I haven't. I haven't. I mean, I'm concentrating on the JAK inhibitors at the moment, but, you know, if I see an opportunity for INOS, I will head in that direction as well. So I, I can connect to this uh, question. So you're finding that IL-36 members um, are upregulated, also point to a, a therapeutic option for an anti-IL-36 receptor, yeah. um, are you also following up on, on this opportunity? Yeah, I'm also interested in that. I mean, uh, uh, the, there's a company in the States called ANAP, for sure. And they were planning a trial in the States, but I think they couldn't recruit enough patients to go ahead. Yeah, this sounds very but, I, but there are other other co companies that have IL-36 inhibitors. So I think, yeah, I think that's an opportunity yeah. as well as IL-23 inhibitors, obviously upstream. I mean, there has been, there have been trials of um, Zecukinumab, which is an IL-17 inhibitor and Ustekinumab in ARCI. But, uh, a mixed bag of ichthyosis patients. Yeah. So, and then Eniko Shankoy has a question. What can be the reason for the difference in the stratum corneum in ABCA12 knockout and the human disease? It seems that the knockout does not have an SE. Yes. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's just... Um, a fault of how we used it. So the cell line we used was telomerase immortalized uh, keratinocytes, and they don't form as good as stratum corneum, but they do form a skin barrier, what seems to be a skin barrier. So the Nile red is in the right place. And you can see with the dye exclusion test that you exclude um, the dye. So the next question is that you have used an impressive range of technologies during your research career. Do you have any advice for new clinical researchers on how to use a range of technologies appropriately in their research or how to gain the relevant skills? I think it's, it's hard. I mean, I think you, I think there's two things. I think you have to, you have to, um, Keep up with the new techniques. I think that's important. And obviously, new technology like spatial transcriptomics or single cell RNA sequencing is very expensive to do in large uh, numbers of patients. But sometimes you might have a, like, for example, I have a, a fellow who's going to do some um, spatial transcriptomics on a very rare patient that I have who has a rhizopathy, who has a keratoderma. She has an epidermal nevus and she's got changes in pigmentation. So that will give insight in one rare patient into changes in the keratinocyte, in the melanocyte and in the hair. She's got a hair change as well. Um, I think that um, getting experience, obviously, in the lab is important. So going to a good, good lab uh, where you've got a good mentor 
who will look for opportunities for you. Um, being part of organizations like the ESDR is good. You know, the ESDR from time to time have had uh, collegiality grants for people to go for a month, uh, six weeks to some other lab to learn a technique. I think keeping two projects on the go all the time is important. You shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket. That's what I always say. You know, you always have to do a few things. <laughs> And you also have to be prepared to change with the time. So I've observed people who've been interested in like one very focused area and there's no changing them from that area. And they just, you know, if funding dries up for that area, they just don't get funding. Good advice. So I was wondering, since H3 keratinocytes are such an important tool to genetically modify and use your um, 3D models, is there a commercial source or only available via um, research collaborations? Um, so we got our uh, telomerase immortalized kerat keratinocytes from uh, Jim Brinewald and he, I think he, he, he just, just expects um, acknowledgement in the paper that that's where you've got them from. He doesn't expect anything else. He doesn't expect to be a co-author or anything like that. I don't know if they're commercially available. It's quite possible that they are. Mm -hmm. So I do not see more patients. Thank you very much again, Adele. And I hand over to Ellie for the closing remarks. Thanks. So uh, Adele, thank you very, very much for um, and this uh, brilliant uh, talk. And uh, I think that you have been also covered uh, the two major important uh, topics that uh, every scientist should always try to uh, reach out to, on the one hand, to deal with uh, science and patients, but also to deal with the patients themselves. And you are doing this uh, in so many um, uh, fields with so many organizations. I think this is really uh, amazing and a lesson for uh, all of us. Thanks. So thank you very much, Adele. And we will meet again um, on March 23rd for our next ESDR Kitchen uh, for a freshly baked uh, new episode uh, on uh, mitochondrial metabolism during wound healing and uh, on the uh, immunopathology of COVID-19. Um, we are, of course, uh, uh, also uh, eagerly waiting for uh, abstract submission for uh, forthcoming meeting. Pay attention to uh, the deadline, May 27. And until then, uh, I'd like to thank you all very much for having been with us uh, and look forward to seeing you back uh, on the 23rd of March. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.